So <clears throat> hello everybody and welcome to today's CSLOP learning webinar uh, on storytelling. Um, as well as working for CSALT, I'm also a writer myself, so this is a particular interesting uh, one for me today. Uh, last year we ran a series of uh, three webinars introducing the core concepts of social leadership. And you can find all of these webinars on our YouTube channel uh, and they went down very well. Uh, we've got nine social leadership um, webinars this year, so an expanded program this year. Um, if you'd like to subscribe to any of these, they're all currently listed on our website. So you can just pop along to csaltlearning.com, go to the events section, and you'll, you can subscribe using a button there, and we can add those to the calendar. So just to remind people, um, if you're new to Zoom, uh, you've got a chat and QA function uh, on the interface. If you could switch your chat setting to everyone, then we'd all get to see the comments that you make. And do feel free to ask questions as the presentation goes on today. We will have time at the end to do a Q&A session with Julian on the content that he's going to deliver. But if you'd like to speak up during the session, uh, we can also just uh, interrupt the session and uh, discuss your thoughts. Um, as per last time, we'll be recording this session. So uh, this will be up on the YouTube channel, uh, Sea Salt Learning, uh, probably uh, well very soon after this, uh, this week. So that just leads me to hand over to the captain of Sea Salt Learning, Julian Stodd. Hey, Julian. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Paul, for a uh, kind introduction. Um, I hope everybody has a drink with them. I have my cup of tea in my Little Miss Sunshine mug. Yes, excellent. Paul's gone for a slightly uh, more mature mug there. Uh, we're talking about storytelling, so I thought uh, storytelling around the campfire with a cup of tea would be appropriate. Now, I'm just going to try and share my screen. So let me get that, that set up. Um, before I start, technology is always here to confound us. So let me just check um, if you can see the screen. I'm getting a thumbs up from Paul, which is good. And then I'm just going to do one other thing so that I can see the chat box because I like to be able to see any comments as they come in. Okay, so um, I will to an extent be able to follow if you're if you're typing questions or comments in the in the chat as we're going so do feel free to um, so this uh, is a well as Paul said one of a series of webinars and it's looking at storytelling and social leadership um, so I'm just going to give a quick foundation of that just to contextualize this in the series of webinars and then we're going to get into exploring probably six or so aspects of storytelling today um, a lot of the material I'm, I'm sharing today is new, so uh, you know if we jump around a bit, please bear with me because uh, if you follow my writing or work, you'll know I, I believe in working out loud and and sharing not just if you like perfectly formed ideas, but some of the stories as they're evolving and being written. So uh, this session is very much in that spirit. What I'm sharing here for those of you who haven't seen it is the model of social leadership that we are exploring. And social leadership is, is contextualized as leadership, which is a, a reputation-based form of authority. So it's authority which is earned within the community as opposed to that which is given to us uh, by the formal system itself. The model here represents really a kind of a loose um, collection of, of uh, competences or skills which I believe social leaders would exhibit. You, you can take it as a development pathway, uh, it's, the, it's certainly the, the pathway we're following through these um, webinars, uh, but it's not intended to be exclusive. It is, if you like, some defining traits of a, a social leader. Effectively starting with choosing a space, curating a space and content, becoming a great storyteller. That's the, uh, the segment we're exploring today, obviously. Learning to share wisely um, and widely, but largely speaking to add signal rather than to add to the noise because we live in a noisy world it then carries on to look at the communities we inhabit the types of communities and indeed i'm very pleased to see um and uh forgive me if i don't get everybody but i think mel you're on the mooc that we're running now um and i can't scroll up to see the other names i saw two or three other familiar names as well i think so the a mooc a massive online open course is another type of community space that's a, a new experiment that started this week um, so we, exist, we, we inhabit many different communities, many different spaces, and social leaders need to understand all of those. 
um, the reputation they earn through their actions will lead into their social authority. And with social authority, we can move into this blue segment at the bottom. We can look at the ability to, um, to co-create uh, content. And I see uh, Mel and Melissa, sisters. So there you are. You can co-create a, a story for us um, today, perhaps. And uh, we build social capital. Uh, and a, a social capital is the ability to survive and thrive in this space. Um, it's really social leaders have a, a responsibility to the community. They don't just draw from it, they contribute into it and hence collaborate. So that's a, I just want to keep that quick, a kind of overview, high level view of the social leadership work. If incidentally you're on this uh, call, if you're interested in this, if you don't have a copy of the social leadership book, if you ping a note through to me afterwards, I'll be happy to send you a, a, a copy out. It's the, the text that uh, this, this uh, series of webinars is based upon. So again, just to show, we're here on number four, storytelling within, um, within that series. And as I've already kind of hinted, this is a, a working out loud uh, session and um, you know, co-creative, reflective. Um, I'm bringing together a number of aspects uh, really for the first time. Uh, and uh, I'll start with this. It's actually an illustration from um, it's an illustration from the book, which should be out next month, which is called uh, My First 100 Days of Social Leadership. It gets down to, it's all very well thinking about social leadership, but what do we do when it gets down to a practical level? Well, you know, practically, what social leaders do is they help us find clarity in uh, uh, an ever busier and ever noisier world. Uh, and they do that through... Uh, sense making and ability to figure stuff out not just by themselves of course because in the social age we're all connected to many different people in many different ways and it's those communities which are sense making so to an extent uh, that's really what what we're doing in this community is we're trying to make sense of it in a formal learning approach an old approach to learning I would be teaching you something and you would be learning something and at the end you'd, you'd pass or fail a test. But that, that kind of model of learning is quite redundant today because we can just find stuff out ever faster. We can be connected to people. So what we really need to do is be very good at figuring stuff out fast, cutting through the noise within our communities. So with that in mind, I've, I've sketched out these... Um, uh, these uh, seven areas, which we'll, we'll try to get through. We'll see uh, how, how far we get with it. But I thought these are important aspects of storytelling um, that I'd like to explore. So we start by thinking about stories and narrative. Now, there are lots of different definitions of, of what this means. I don't really want to get into a, a, an academic conversation about it, but I did, did want to um, just start with this slide to describe a, 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 what I talk about in terms of story and narrative. And the example that I tend to use is, is this, the Titanic, um, as you'll see, magnificently drawn by myself over a cup of tea last week. Uh, this is the Titanic steaming towards the iceberg. It's a well-known story. Uh, now, usually I'll say the narrative is the information architecture. It is, I guess, what you could call the, the facts of the matter. The Titanic was built, uh, sailed from Southampton towards New York, hit an iceberg and sank. Um, there is one narrative. Uh, there are many different stories told around that narrative, though. So one story is the, the daily newspapers that were written um, the, the day after reporting the sinking of the Titanic. One story would be the film made in the 60s. One story is the Leonardo DiCaprio interpretation of that, standing on the bow and singing that dreadful song. Um, and there's even a, a story in Doctor Who, for those of you that follow that, where the TARDIS runs into the Titanic. So, you know, the, the narrative is essentially the same. The Titanic, in that case, is a spaceship and the, the iceberg it runs into is the TARDIS. But it's, it broadly is recognisable for what it is. The reason I'm making this differentiation is because um, very often uh, we, uh, when we're sharing stories in organisations, what we really want to share is the underlying meaning, the underlying narrative. But we often get very fixated on the story itself. Organizations are very good at telling formal stories, you know, those which are written in glossy brochures and, and pushed out through formal broadcast channels. Whilst actually there are lots of different types of stories and many of them are more magnetic than those formal stories. They spread through the system faster. If we think about the three 
I really just want, want to focus on three levels of stories, three types of stories represented by the, the circle in the middle here. Personal narratives are you know, personal stories of learning and change over time. They're the stories that we all individually tell. Uh, Co-created stories are those which are written by a community. They're where we come together, the sense-making stories. So they kind of um, take all of the individual narratives and bring them together to some kind of consensus view or opinion. Although, uh, I mean, they don't have to be about consensus, but they represent the, the breadth of views held by a community. Organizational stories are those which the organization writes. And historically, organizations have tended to start here. They started at the organizational level and they kind of cascaded stories out. They pushed stories out through broadcast models, out through the community. Today, uh, a socially dynamic organization won't do that, or at least won't do that all the time. It will spend a good deal of time supporting people individually with their ability to capture and, and shape and share their personal stories. It will work with communities to empower and enable them to co-create and write their stories. And only finally will it come together and write the organizational story based upon that. So um, that's really why I wanted to, to, to start with that piece there. I'll, I'll also, um, I just bought this in here. It, it, it's interesting, when we set up the webinar, these are some of the things that people uh, said they would like to talk about relating to stories. And I, I thought it, it was, it's kind of behind the scenes, if you like, but I thought it was worth sharing because it really illustrates for me the broad range of interests that we have in storytelling. Um, you know, people recognize, I think, inherently the power of, of stories. And, and what we see here, we want to use stories to support change stories to support learning, stories to support sales, uh, people just a sort of general interest in how stories work. Um, and uh, the thing I really liked, of course, was down at the bottom here, learning the art of storytelling. Well, you know, quite right, because storytelling isn't particularly a, a science, although, you know, one can, of course, learn mechanisms of storytelling. We can learn about the psychology of it, the neurology of it, you know, how a story is processed in the brain, but none of that will make us a great storyteller. What will make us a great storyteller is the strength of our narrative, the authenticity of our story, our ability to choose the right mechanisms, the right media, the right modalities to, to share our stories with, to make those stories timely and relevant uh, to those people around them. Um, authenticity is something that we'll come on to talk about later. Let's just go back to those three levels of stories and just quickly look at, um, you, you know, how they work. So personal stories typically would be, you know, stories of what I've heard, what I'm going to do, what I think about stuff. They're, they're very deeply grounded. These are not high level meta narratives. These aren't broad organizational brochures and stories of change journeys. These are quite gritty, everyday, grounded stories in my everyday reality. Now, in the social age, the mechanisms of storytelling have been substantially democratized. So, you know, personally, I write a blog every day and I don't have to ask a permission to do that. I don't have to, in fact, pay anything to do that. I use WordPress, which is one of the many free blogging sites. It's, um, it's a democratized capability. And that democratization is, is a key part of how um, individual stories and community stories challenge the authenticity of organizations and it speaks to the challenge of why we need social leadership. Formal leaders can't exert influence in this space. Uh, indeed, by attempting to do so, they just make the space formal or kill the conversation off. If you work for an organization and you write a blog about your personal experience, I would argue that the organization has no right unless you're breaching some confidentiality clause. If you're just reflecting on what you're doing, there's no right of an organization to impose itself in that space. But you may give them a permission to engage in the conversation. I had a fascinating story this morning. I was talking to one of the, the, the big uh, oil companies and uh, they told a story about a very successful, high revenue generating product that they have. Um, for tracking effectively where their resources are around the world. And the story they told was of how that 
product got developed, how it got innovated. And it got innovated by somebody becoming so frustrated with the internal system blocking them that he went outside the organization and he crowdsourced, crowdfunded, and built the prototype of the product and then came back and showed it to the organization that decided they wanted to buy it. He said it was easier to go out and operate outside the organization in the arms and support of his community than it was to innovate within the organization. And that's uh, staggering. You know, his story is one of deep authenticity and effectiveness and the desire to be effective and of being prevented from being effective by everything the organization put in front of him. Um, so personal stories are very powerful and often move faster than organizational stories do. Co-created stories are, are, are very interesting in, in terms of social learning or when we think about the tacit tribal knowledge that sits within communities, be they uh, small teams, uh, be they uh, engineering populations. These, um, these communities tend to actually hold a great deal of the wisdom and one could argue value of an organization in them. Now, co-created stories uh, don't have to uh, be ag agreed upon, if you like. They, they don't have to be one story which is perfect, which says we all agree on this. They can chart how our opinions differ. They're a very valuable part of uh, a social learning approach, the ability to understand where difference sits in a population for the simple reason that people are different. You know, we operate differently. And the thing we should learn from evolution is that, is that uh, mutation and diversity are strengths. You know, they allow us to adapt uh, ever faster. So co-created stories are, are sort of individual and group sense-making stories, reflective and evolutionary types of stories. Organizational stories, um, you know, tend to um, historically have just, as I say, been pushed down. In a dynamic organization, they will not just be top down. There will be times, of course, when an exec wants to broadcast down or when formal leaders want to push stories through the system. But a wise organization is one that will listen. It will listen to those gritty everyday stories, the personal narratives. It will listen to what its communities are saying and indeed may seek to actively crowdsource um, solutions from those communities and it will learn to be excellent. I was, I was working, um, talking to one of the banks yesterday uh, and they were describing how they have a, a crowdsourcing problem solving channel. So people can throw their problems in there and typically uh, they get marked as resolved within two hours. Now, organizations can't do very much in the space of two hours. They can't even get around to building a spreadsheet and having a planning meeting. They can barely build a Gantt chart, and yet you've got a community of people there who are solving problems in two hours. Now, the interesting thing for me was that this was a senior HR person describing it to me, and they said, I don't really know how it works. There's nothing documented, nothing's written down. I don't even know who's in the community. And I have a distinct feeling that the community is taking ownership of itself and is moving forward beyond what we had hoped to achieve from it. The most significant part of that story is that she was willing to let it happen because the point about co-ownership and co-creation, be it in learning, in leadership or in change, is that the co means something. It means it's not dominated any longer by the organization with its formal power. It has to be a dynamic relationship between the two. So I just wanted to, to run through that. The three levels, I, I think, of storytelling are, are, are quite important against this backdrop of evolved power and control. And this is really the heart of social leadership, where power has been substantially democratized and devolved, evolved, you know, where authority increasingly sits based on reputation, at least as much as it sits within formal hierarchy. Uh, we need to understand how to be better social leaders and how storytelling is a key component of that. The other thing, of course, we need to understand about, uh, about stories, and apologies for saying day 14 at the top, uh, I, I think I've already claimed the disclaimer of this being um, a, uh, a, a reflective session. I've just pulled this in from an illustration from the new book about uh, my first 100 days of social leadership, and this, funnily enough, is the illustration for day 14. And it talks about how we should consider what content do we consume most often. Um, and of course, the content we consume most often is that which is compelling, which is mobile, 
which is interesting, which is authentic. It's, it's very rare that people say that the content I consume most often is the formal stories given to me by the organization. Typically, they reach into their community, they reach out. So understanding the content that we individually consume, what stories do you read every hour of every day, is probably a pretty good indicator of the spaces in which we need to be excellent as storytellers, as social leaders. We certainly need to be aware of those spaces. So um, we can think about storytelling in terms, this incidentally is the illustration I use in the social leadership book to talk about storytelling, but I'm not really going to go into this today because uh, I'd be sort of duplicating. We can think about you know, how we take a stance, how we choose our genre, how we put our values into stories. This might be a, a slide I would use to talk about how we do storytelling, but I, I wanted to use this webinar as a more reflective uh, space of the ways we uh, are engaged with stories in, in different ways. So I'm not gonna go uh, deep into this one now. I'll just finish off this, this piece talking about uh, stories and narrative to respond to one of those comments somebody had left earlier about social learning. You know, how, how do we use storytelling in social learning? Well, this, this piece comes from uh, the article you can find online on uh, scaffolded social learning. And scaffolded social learning is a co-creative, story-based approach to learning. And it uses these formal components. The boxes are formal components. The bubbles are the co-created group narrative. So that's that second layer of storytelling. The boxes, if you like, the, the formal layer is the story the organization tells. The bubbles are spaces where the organization is willing to relinquish control, to stand back and see what happens and let the group co-create its narrative. So um, uh, if anyone's particularly interested in, in social learning, then drop me a, a line and I'll, I'll, I'll link you out some of the resources um, around that piece but that that i wanted to just share this because this is really how we use stories different levels of stories in in uh, specifically to support learning so the next piece i wanted to um to think about were the voices um you know where where do these voices sit what are the stories that we are hearing in the organization well i've i've been um i sketched this up quite recently and I've used it to talk increasingly about the core challenge of the social age, which is the interrelationship, or what I call a dynamic tension between these two entities. The, the formal structure um, on the left, the, the boxes, the sort of uh, pseudo-organizational chart, represents everything within a formal organization. It's the infrastructure, the assets, the resources, the people, the, uh, the org chart, the formal hierarchies of power, it's the distribution mechanism, factories, tooling, it's all the rest of it. Everything on that side is owned and controlled ultimately by the organization. Uh, on the other side are the social structures. It's the interpersonal relationships, the bonds of trust, um, the friendships, the relationships, the sense-making capability. It's the human system that we all exist within. Now, of course, these in reality don't sit next to each other. The social structure overlays and suffuses the formal system and wraps around the edges of it. Uh, and so when uh, that example I used earlier, when somebody is describing that sense making that takes place within two hours, it doesn't happen in the formal structure. It happens in the social structure. It's people who have high reputation, high credibility, are able to hear that the question's been asked, are able to be connected to resources or ideas to solve it. That all happens in the social structure. So our challenge is to work out which voices sit where. Formal leaders have voices which, sits in the, which sit in the formal structure. Individuals who have no formal leadership have voices that sit in the social structure. Um, and it's finding those different voices and bringing them together. Indeed, this is a slide I use in the change work, but I brought it in here because it represents the fact, you know, there are, two, there are always two different perspectives on any story in an organizational context. There's the organizational story, and historically that view dominated. But increasingly today, the individual stories are relevant. And it's the way we bring those together um, that we can co-create that future, future state. The stories are, are quite interesting. They're not all level, they're not all equal. They can be given mass and momentum. They can be given power through a range of factors. So, they can be given power uh, through formal authority. 
if somebody is a senior leader, that does imbue their story with a certain type of power, but not the only type of power. Uh, if somebody has great authenticity, if they are deemed as um, you know, being very credible in a space, then their story has great power as well, but it's a socially moderated type of authority. There's an interesting case playing out in Northern Ireland at the moment about a young girl, a 14 year old girl who is in a legal battle with Facebook. And she's in that battle because she, she is claiming that Facebook has a responsibility to prevent photographs that she had previously shared from continuing to be shared. And those are the kind of photographs that are the result of a, a mistake that any teenager might make. They're not stories that she wants to be shared. Now, that's tied into a battle between government and internet service providers uh, about who is responsible for the content that's shared. Now, nobody's yet willing to impose that responsibility fully on, on the organizations like Facebook. So we end up with an interesting situation. Facebook will almost certainly win the legal battle that they've taken due steps to prevent that story being shared. But ultimately, um, they will probably win the formal and the legal battle but they will absolutely not win the social reputation and authority because a 14 year old girl who doesn't want that type of photo shared clearly has the moral supremacy in the argument. So stories are given different types of power and a key feature of the social age is the balancing effects of that. Social authority isn't an effect of mass and momentum. It's a, it's a feature of authenticity and fairness. And in this case, she has that on her side. So stories kind of battle for power and control, both within the formal system and also outside and around it. And of course, we can relate this to what we're uh, seeing in, in the US at the moment, which we might have time to touch on later, the, the new ecosystem of, of stories um, as we move uh, into a whole new, uh, whole new era. Of course, um, Stories are, are shared through formal channels and social. So we'll get on later to look at some graffiti. Um, but the interesting thing about stories is that if they're not given a space, people will claim a space. And graffiti is interesting in that context because uh, it, it, sometimes I describe it as the, the, the last voice, the last voice which is claimed by people who are given no other voice or space to, to speak in. So if we don't give people permission to be authentic and share their stories, they will simply claim a space. You know, this is another representation, really, of how stories sit within organizations. Formal stories may be anchored to your desk in a particular place within the hierarchy. But of course, social stories, that social structure which flows around it, is no great respecter of formal boundaries. Um, you know, you could almost describe, uh, historically, we might have called that gossip. But actually, it's not gossip. It's sense making. It's the wisdom of the tribe. It's the, the, the flow of stories through the formal organization. So, you know, what's the role of storytellers in the social age and indeed of social leaders as storytellers? Well, I'd argue that the role of social leaders is not to amplify and spread formal stories. Your formal leaders can do that. You know, if an organization wants to say this is the change journey we're taking or this is what we're doing this month, that's OK. They have formal channels. They have formal authority. They can push that formal story through the system. Social leaders have their finger on the pulse of the organization because they are within those communities. So I think that the role of our social storytellers and our social leaders are social storytellers are to weave stories of difference and similarity to say, part of a group believes this and part believes that, their role isn't to judge it, it's to recognize and accept that difference. Now, one of the other questions that came up earlier was around uh, change in the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK. And I'll use that as an example, although it would relate more widely. Um, the NHS is sort of characterized by being too, just massive, too big to change, with very high tensions between what are deemed as deeply authentic caregivers uh, right at the front line of healthcare. Um, people who are held in high social regard by the community, the doctors, the consultants, the junior doctors, the nurses, and the political masters, the accountants, the management, the bean counters, who are deemed to be sort of inauthentic or have low credibility. So the system as a whole is gridlocked um, in terms of change. 
you find interestingly in the NHS pockets of extreme innovation and extreme excellence, but overall at a system level, a deep resistance and inability to change. Now, storytelling can help us to cut through that, but only and crucially if we are willing to engage in the difference. Um, for as long as we remain within our own communities, and this really is the, the parallel with what we're seeing in the US at the moment as an interesting development, as long as we retreat into the, uh, the we can call it an echo chamber, or we can use a, a sort of sociological language of uh, a confirmation bias, as long as we stick within those communities of people who share our views, we are unintentionally, but very deliberately reinforcing our difference. And we are perpetuating the lethargy and stagnation of, of the organization. Social leaders can help to bridge that by at least seeking to document and understand areas of similarity and difference. So in the other body of work I'm, I'm, I'm just finishing off the book on at the moment, Around Change, we explicitly uh, look at this. And if you're interested in change, it's a really um, important area to explore. I'm going to just jump over that one at the moment because uh, time keeps ticking by. We're halfway through and uh, I've got lots more I want to get into. So I want to talk about just authenticity. Um, as a, a sort of foundation piece, you know, authenticity is interesting. It's talked about quite a lot at the moment. I take a fairly uh, pragmatic view uh, because uh, despite being an optimist, I'm also a pragmatist. Uh, authenticity is the kind of root of your um, actions. It's what sits underneath it. Uh, if you have authenticity, it will be reflected in your actions. Uh, if you take actions which are out of kilter with your um, deeply held core values, then, uh, you know, like it or not, you're not acting authentically. And the thing about authenticity is it's not, a, it's not a, a precious gem to be hidden away and locked up and never shared with the world. It's something which flavors every moment, everything that we do. So you kind of have to wear it on your sleeve and, and have it out there. Um, you can't uh, buy authenticity. Indeed, trying to buy authenticity can be very risky. There's an interesting story in the news, actually, this week in the UK about a bookstore chain. So we have a sort of an old bookshop chain called Waterstones, uh, which is uh, probably a little like Borders was in the, uh, in the US. Um, but, you know, a big, big bookstore it has uh, bookshops on many of the high streets. It sort of emerged this week that on three high streets, in small towns or villages, it's operating bookshops that look like they are local independent traders. They're called things like um, Y books and uh, they have quaint sort of rustic sounding names and they, they look like a small bookshop. Now, Waterstones never really sought to hide this. They actually announced that they were doing this in 2014 and, and, and started it off then. But it suddenly caught fire because the community has become interested in it. And it's saying, well, it's not fair, you know, that the small town high street is a place for independent resellers and you are cheating somehow by operating your big brand um, under that kind of um, persona. So really, to me, that's a question of, of authenticity. Um, you know, should Waterstones uh, have some social force exerted on it where it has to always say this is a Waterstone store? Or, you know, do market forces apply and it's simply allowed to operate under many brands? Because, of course, the reality is many of the small high street brands that we see are, of course, owned behind the scenes by big conglomerates. So, you know, authenticity is quite important. The, the, the social community is very unforgiving of attempts to cheat when it comes to authenticity. Authenticity, if you like, this is another illustration from the next book. I, I like... Uh, I want to sort of show how it's the, it's the roots that everything grows out of. So you need to kind of think about your authenticity as a social leader, and it's reflected in the stories uh, that you tell. So in that sense, you know, if we get it right, if we put down deep roots, then it will, it will bear fruit. That's the uh, rather simplistic uh, metaphor at work in this illustration. Uh, but of course, what damages authenticity? Well, you know, life, uh, bluntly speaking, life gets in the way of, of authenticity. People who end up acting without authenticity in their stories, people who share stories that maybe, you know, are not uh, totally aligned with their deeply held values. These, they're not generally bad people doing bad things. They're just kind of 
end up in that space. You know, that, that it, work presents us with plenty of challenges. Um, for example, um, a, a leader in a business today is likely to be connected with people socially. They, they may be friends on Facebook. They may have originally worked together in a call center and slowly been promoted up into a leadership position. So suddenly we inhabit two spaces. One is a friendship space. One is a formal relationship of power. Now that manager may discover that there's gonna be some change in the organization which threatens the job security of their friends. Now, how do they act with authenticity? They can break the, the formal contract, if you like, they have with the organization and tell that person. Um, but that in itself uh, gives both parties a, a, a challenge. You know, who's in the right, who's in the wrong? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, life throws these challenges at us. So authenticity isn't, um, it's not something that's won once and kept forever. It's something that we need to be kind of constantly aware of and that filters through uh, into, our, into our, our stories, into our words, you know. Um, and reputation is built out of it. So if we tell good stories with authenticity, um, the, the, the net result of that is reputation. If we act inauthentically, if the words and the stories that we use are inauthentic, our reputation will become one of in, inauthenticity. Uh, however, if we um, consistently act in the right way, then we will be deemed, if we are lucky, to, to, to be authentic. And authenticity will help us earn our reputation. And reputation in the social leadership frame leads directly to social authority. So earning reputation is, is at the heart of it. So I'm gonna move on. I, I know we're moving fast. So uh, you know, thank you for bearing with us as we do so. To talk about amplification and sharing. These are features of the system. These are really at the heart of why formal organizations are often confounded by uh, social stories because social stories well amplified well crafted stories spread far and fast whilst formal organizations often struggle to catch up i was actually um having a conversation on twitter last week about maps because when we send out the social leadership book with its metaphor of exploration they get wrapped in maps and i needed to find some more maps so i just asked twitter i reached into my community and asked twitter and um uh, somebody and i'm trying to think actually it may even have been somebody that's in this group here uh linked me and said oh you know the, the uh, ordnance survey provided maps to schools and maybe they've got some spare from that now that conversation happened last week and only on monday morning at nine o'clock did the ordnance survey engage in the story now you know that's fine good on them they engaged in it but uh, they were a bit late to the party because social stories don't play by formal rules they don't operate nine to five in fact my instinctive reaction when they engaged was oh you know that's like an old story that's that's kind of gone now it's finished because uh, stories of course are, are reasonably synchronous quite often so understanding the speed the pace the momentum of stories is is quite important and equally understanding um understanding the the, the way the community is structured i i, I um, use this one if you are um particularly interested in community uh, the second webinar from now will be on community. And I think there's um, one up on YouTube already which touches on this. Uh, it, it really explores how community isn't level, it's not flat. It's, uh, it has nodes and amplifiers. Uh, they're often contextual, but people who are well connected, people who are sense makers, people who have particular expertise, people who are particularly well connected. Indeed, um, if we look back to curation in social leadership, we choose the space we want to be in. So uh, if you want to be the person that's great at uh, managing finance or the person that's great at project planning or the person that has particular expertise in a science subject, you would choose your space, you'd curate it and carry out all of your activities in line with that. But to understand amplification, we have to understand where the nodes are within our network because it's through these nodes that stories flow. Um, so, it's really uh, important to understand the mechanisms of, of, of that. And of course, key to how stories flow individually, a, a skill for social leaders to learn is to make their, is to interpret um, what they're given, to make their story relevant to the context of the individual and timely. So the interesting thing about stories is I could share something with you, which is extremely interesting, you know, here's hoping, but it might just not be timely. It's just not relevant for you at the moment. In three months time, it might be very relevant 
Uh, so then you'd need a way to access it fast. So the timeliness of stories is important. Organizations, of course, are, are often very bad at this. So they work on a notion that when you start, they'll train you up with everything you need, and then they kick you off and, and sort of expect that you'll remember it in six months' time when you need it. Whilst out in the real world, um, our relationship with knowledge itself has changed significantly. Much more on-demand, contextual, um, just provided to us. Uh, much like, really, me reaching out onto Twitter, asking where I can find some maps. I could have Googled it. In fact, I did Google it. I bought some on eBay. But I also reached out into my community. That's how we find things out. So for our stories to be amplified, um, they need to be relevant. They need to be timely. And this slide, I, I dropped this one in at the last minute because, again, a, a couple of those questions that have come in talking about change, you know, how do we, how do we uh, use stories in change within organizations? Well, like this, we all have our individual stories, but we find uh, a shared story together and social leaders can help with this, bringing together these stories of difference, these stories of similarity. Uh, within a narrative framework and building a shared story. Indeed, I, I sometimes use this one to talk about or what organizational change should be, is not some monolithic change process imposed on the system. Really, uh, the organization should only seek to frame the change. And true change is a whole load of aligned learning stories running through. And in fact, this is relevant with the MOOC that's running at the moment. I rather like MOOCs. This is the first one that I've run because there's something like 250 people going through that, but they're all building their own narrative. They're all finding their own way through it, but they're doing so within a community. So really, this is what a, a social learning experience looks like. It's 250 separate uh, created narratives and then a community that surrounds all of those uh, pieces. Now, I'm going to keep moving at a pace, if I may, not least because I'm really keen to get to the last section, which has some graffiti in it. So we'll, uh, we'll move on to think about signal and noise. Um, I, I, I said, I think, earlier that a role of social leaders is to filter signal from the noise. And that's because we are in this increasingly noisy world. We need to be able to figure out what's valid and what's relevant at speed. And a great way of doing that is through our community. Um, obviously quite relevant at the moment, um, the ongoing discussion about uh, President Trump in the US and how he came to power and how he will exercise power. And uh, I, I used this in, in an article that I wrote a few weeks ago about the communication ecosystem which he's operating within. Um, typically our formal organizations and indeed our political systems um, are built on uh, this old model of in individual on the top left here into formal media channels. So, uh, you know, individual politicians work within a system and the formal media takes what they say and interprets it. They write the news effectively and then they broadcast the news out to the rest of us and we respond to it. That's a traditional model. Of course, what we've seen in the last few years is that in parallel to this, um, as people share their story, or in fact, more often, in response to the formal news story, the community gets around it. It does its fact checking, its sense making, it responds to it. It creates a socially moderated story. The interesting thing that we've seen, obviously, in the early days of, of, of President Trump's um, reign uh, is that he has chosen to recast deliberately this picture. He has moved this arrow which points down to formal media and uh, he's pointed it over uh, towards social media and said I'm actually engaging directly with my audience and indeed he's cast the formal media as the villains of the piece and you know that's that's quite interesting it remains to be seen how that will play out now um, Harriet has uh, asked here see a lot of channels old and new where do sources and facts fit in well you know that's a really fascinating question uh, I can only give you a couple, of, a couple of light responses to that. One is that it's clear in this new world that understanding validity is important. You know, anybody that takes what they read in any channel um, as, as uh, God's given truth is, is, is probably at risk of, uh, of getting themselves caught out. So in our education systems and in our sense-making ability as leaders, we need to understand validity. 
But there's a flip side to that. We also need to understand that validity does not just come from the old mechanisms that it came by. So if we think about science, uh, Western scientific methodology has run for 2000 years on a process of hypothesis and experimentation and review and publication with peer review. And that's given us all the scientific and academic journals. That um, traditionally is a source of validity. It's valid because it's been peer reviewed. It's been scrutinized. It has, it's replicable. Now that's, uh, that's very good. But we've seen the emergence of Wikipedia as co-created uh, knowledge. Now, there was a view uh, from the universities that it was no good because it wasn't valid. So, you know, students weren't allowed to quote it. But if you look at the, the research from uh, nearly two years ago now, comparing Wikipedia to uh, the journal Nature across 42 hard science subjects. It showed that Wikipedia uh, had two ser uh, three serious factual errors and uh, Nature had two serious factual errors. Wikipedia had 170 minor factual errors odd and um, Nature had about 150 minor factual errors. So um, the old model of inquiry and validity was more valid, but Wikipedia is learning to be valid. It's, it's the cognitive surplus of, of billions of individuals putting it together. So um, I, I kind of can't give you a straight answer to your question, Harriet. Um, I think that sources are very important and understanding the validity clearly of sources is important. And even video sources, we can no longer take uh, at their word. I think it's very important to um, understand uh, echo chamber effects in, in uh, and if you're interested in this uh, you know the sociological the feature of confirmation bias is interesting so if you take a group of a thousand people if you uh, a community of a thousand people and you ask someone how many people do they know well in that community they will consistently overestimate the number of people that they know and that happens at scale so everybody assumes they know more people within a community than they actually do and when we uh, listen to the news that's going on around us, those things which confirm what we already believe, we give greater uh, cognitive weighting to. So it's called confirmation bias because it broadly means once I've made up my mind, uh, the things I hear in the ecosystem will tend to reinforce that view and crucially will tend to make me think that I am more right. Um, Facts, of course, are an interesting thing. Um, I don't subscribe to much of the conversation playing out at the moment about post-truth and post-fact economy because the simple reason um, that very few people will stand up and say, I am constantly deluded by fake news and I'm highly susceptible to fake facts. What they generally say is there's lots of poor idiots out there who, who are susceptible to it and, you know, I'm not. So it's a, it feels like an early attempt at rationalising it. I think what we can say is um, that facts have never been diamonds formed over billions of years and, uh, you know, sort of carved out of stone. Um, in, in a scientific context or indeed in a societal context, the fact is typically the best guess we have at the moment, uh, but it's always susceptible to disruption. So it's a fascinating topic. And of course, it sits at the heart of authenticity and, and storytelling. I'll move on from there, but you know, keep that thought live and, uh, and let's stay engaged around, around that. I think I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on a little bit fast if it's all right with you, because we've only got uh, 10 minutes left and uh, I, uh, we've covered some good ground, but I wanted to, um, I think I'm gonna take us right through to the last section. So forgive me avoiding filters and pollution. I want to talk about storytellers, but a simple reason, it'll give us a chance just to look at how some stories work. Uh, out in the world. And the reason I'm sharing these is because a key thing we need to do uh, as individuals, um, as social leaders, and within organizations is to experiment. We need to learn uh, how to be better storytellers. So for fun, I just thought I would share um, some of the stories I've sort of gathered going uh, all around the world uh, from graffiti. And I, I talked about graffiti earlier about how it's often a voice which is claimed and it's used for all sorts of uh, different reasons. This, uh, this particular, um, so I'm just gonna share some of these and just share a few thoughts around those just to sort of finish this up. Uh, the, the, this piece is a, a, a bit of Banksy graffiti, so you may have come across it before at the old post office in London. Um, and it, it's obviously has uh, uh, that history, that legacy of, of political comment that perhaps in Victorian times would have been written on a pamphlet um, 
and circulated. And today, of course, you know, the school child uh, painting that and down the bottom left, you can see the security guard and dog, um, you know, shouting up at them. So political commentary through graffiti, a claimed story of subversion um, is, is uh, really interesting, uh, I, I find. Um, you get this kind of um, street uh, shared wisdom storytelling with no particular purpose. I mean, this is, what could you say this is? It's sort of social commentary shared at the back of a car park. Um, it's a reflective thought. Um, it's quite nice. <laughs> it's an easily consumed story, easily shareable story. Of course, much graffiti these days is, is tagged to make it shareable, um, you know, put up on, on blogs and, and, and Twitter and, and so forth. Um, I'm going to just, uh, let me just mention that a couple of these images further in, I've got a few swear words in. Okay, so there's nothing, uh, there's nothing too obscene, but I just uh, wanted to mention that in case anybody's watching it in an office, there will be a couple of swear words. So um, I'll, I'll try to warn you when they're coming up and uh, please take them in the spirit intended to uh, look at this. This is interesting. It's a memorial uh, graffiti. You see this, this one's in um, San Francisco. Um, there's uh, a few spots in, in San Francisco that, uh, that have a, a lot of um, often a gang related memorial type uh, graffiti. So stories of remembrance. Um, I found it interesting being in New York uh, after the Twin Towers came down, looking at how the early memorial um, for the Twin Towers was cast in bronze and shows the firefighters washing, um, washing their faces in a fire hydrant. And it's interesting because bronzes have this sense of churches and uh, the memorials of the First World War and the Second World War. They're typically um, longer term, literally hard cast stories that last a long time. Um, this type of memorial, like a graffiti, a sketched uh, story, uh, tend to be more disposable, tend to be faster moving. <coughs> this is a piece um, of quite widespread graffiti in San Francisco which speaks of social unrest between the, um, between the uh, big uh, tech companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Uber, and so on, and a large and disenfranchised homeless population and uh, a, a whole layer um, of more uh, impoverished individuals that sit underneath it uh, and feel they are being forced out of their housing, out of their neighborhoods, out of their communities through the vast purchasing power uh, in housing and in commodities um, of, of those people. So there's a whole series of pieces there uh, which uh, tell that story, claim spaces to illustrate that fight between uh, the two. Uh, this is also actually in San Francisco, I quite like it, uh, just a, a bit of graffiti on the side of a school. This is actually a Mexican um, school in uh, San Francisco, I'm not, uh, and it has a, a range of inspirational formal murals outside it, but then uh, sort of quite simple, you know, what would, what would um, kind of inspire somebody to, to write that? You know, is it a plea, is it a commentary? Is it, uh, you know, what is that? A sort of slightly abstract story, I guess. Um, this also, uh, I rather liked, uh, this is just a building site. Um, over in the States and the, 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 I don't know if this was organized or spontaneous, but the, um, the graffiti on this tells a story. It's a very positive slant, community, diversity, teamwork. You know, maybe it's a, I, I could imagine a story around it. Maybe it's a youth group, who knows? Maybe it's, a, maybe it's people doing community service. Maybe it's a school, um, but nonetheless, uh, quite a positive slant. Um, this kind of, abstract this one's in in london uh people just sharing wisdom uh or you know what passes for wisdom or humor but it's it's this is again claimed spaces that uh that people could do that probably a twist of irony in this one uh you know you can make conceptual art and stick it up on a wall somewhere um this you know much sort of harder end of things this is about the san francisco police department um uh, shooting uh young people so this is uh you know clearly a uh, very direct uh story it's a protest uh voice graffiti is often used uh, for protest um sometimes in terms of beautiful art sometimes uh much more 
uh, blunt kind of stories. So the next slide, as I've mentioned, has a little swearing on it. So I just sort of uh, warn you. But you know, again, this is uh, one of the alleyways in um, in San Francisco. It's interesting, really. It uses fonts, um, which are sort of typically a feature of high design work, so publishing and printing. Uh, so it's using a range of fonts and design principles, but obviously it's this kind of random expression of uh, uh, of what, you know, of kind of like dissatisfaction and unhappiness. This uh, I really like. So this graffiti is written by a robot, um, and it's written by a robot in San Diego um, that trundles around, and it's writing in water. Uh, so uh, this has all sorts of interesting elements. The first is that you can text the robot. Um, if you text or tweet the robot, it will write in water. Uh, so it, it's, it's actually an adapted inkjet printer. So it, it, it writes whatever you want it to write. And some of these were little love stories. Some of them were swearing. Some of them are political. But the, it, of course, has this wonderful transience about it. So the spoken voice uh, fades away fast. Uh, the written word lasts longer. Memorials cast in bronze last a long time. But these stories um, are crowdsourced and dry and fade away in, in minutes. I quite like that. You know, live a great story. Good advice from Amsterdam there. Um, obviously, sorry for not warning you, there's a little bit of uh, further social dissent there. Although interestingly, um, since the kind of punk movement, this now sits almost in cliche in terms of uh, what it said. You see this, I actually have a whole collection of these from all around the world, kind of just, um, I guess, raw and visceral, but also slightly uh, ironic uh, these days. Uh, a couple of pieces here about the plight of the bees. So these are kind of, you could argue, sort of scientific uh, commentary. You know, this one here, you know, no more bees, no more pollen, no more plants, no more animals, no more humans. Um, and the bee saying, save me. This one's up in uh, Shoreditch in London. And interestingly, um, you find spaces where graffiti tends to aggregate storytelling spaces for society. Now, I think we're running uh, short, running out of time. I'll just uh, share uh, one about refugees. Another one about uh, money. I quite like this. Uh, this is a sticker campaign um, around the Netherlands. I love Iran, but this, uh, th this one has already been subverted by somebody who also loves Tirana, um, which I don't know if that's a place or uh, his girlfriend's name or her girlfriend's name, but uh, I like the way it was subverted. And of course, uh, sort of ad hoc warning graffiti, stories of severe death. So on that note, um, I will... Uh, wrap up. Thank you for bearing uh, with with us through uh, a little tour through storytelling. Um, really, I think Paul is back with us here to bring us uh, back back to reality. And uh, uh, there you go, Paul. Great. Thank you very much, Julian. That was a, a tour de force on storytelling. I really appreciate that. Um, just got a couple of seconds before we finish. Um, if there are any other questions to ask. Um, you can pop that up in the chat if you can. Uh, Harriet, thanks for your question earlier. Uh, just whilst we're waiting to see if there are any more comments, uh, to, just to remind you, there are two more uh, webinars coming up in one in the end of March and one in April. Uh, the one at the end of the March is on sharing, uh, and that's at the same time on March the 28th. And then we have one on community, as uh, Julian mentioned, on April the 18th. So they're coming fairly thick and fast this year. So uh, I do hope we can see you there as well. So um, we're coming up to the hour. I don't think we have any more questions today. So thank you very much, Julian, for the presentation. And thank you all to, to the viewers who've been watching this today and for your participation. Hope to see you again on the next Sea Salt webinar. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. Thanks, everybody.